the world that uh, we are living through now where, uh, for one thing, certain forms of conservatism, quite comparative, quite comparable forms of conservative thought um, seem to be on the rise. Maybe we need to think about um, them together. But that's just by way of uh, <coughs> sort of thinking about the Rudolphs because, as Gary mentioned, I was a, um, I'm just thinking of Rudolph's openness to anything new, uh, good or bad, that was happening in the world and, uh, of course, in South Asia and in, and in India in particular. It, one example of that was that when I joined uh, University of Chicago, I found that the Rudolphs had actually got money from Mellon to run a three or five year program on subaltern studies. Uh, without having any formal connection with Subaltern. So that's where I met, I met Shail first, was because Shail came as a visiting fellow in that program. Um, they ran a, a workshop on comparative South Asian and Middle Eastern studies, which was always a wonderfully stimulating seminar to go to. <clears throat> they were always so proud of Dalit politics. And I remember them talking about that as, a, as an achievement. And, uh, they would go around saying how India had achieved a silent revolution uh, electorally by transferring a lot of political power to lower castes and, and people from disadvantaged backgrounds like, like Dalits. Um, and one always wonders what they would make of the present situation or how one, would, one could even think of the present situation through their frameworks. And, um, and uh, <clears throat> I mean, they were, of course, evolving in their own thinking. So with that in mind, we invited uh, the three very distinguished scholars uh, here uh, sitting next to me. And we'll, I mean, I'll give them very short introductions before they speak. And uh, we'll hear them. They'll each uh, uh, speak for about 15, 20 minutes. And then we'll open it up for discussions. And uh, we thought, I thought I'd begin, I will go alphabetically. So, but it also works out nicely because uh, Rohan D'Souza, to my left, uh, has offered to speak on a large theme, whereas um, Shail's and Asha's are kind of working more directly through Rudolph's or talking about Rudolph's. Uh, so just to introduce um, um, Peter Ronald D'Souza from the Center for Study of Developing Societies. Um, so um, he will be talking about the imperialism of categories situated knowledge in a globalizing world. And Professor D'Souza is a professor at, as I said, at the CSDS and holds the Dr. S. Radhakrishnan Chair of Rajya Sabha. He was the director of the Indian Institute of Advanced Study, Shimla, where he served two terms from 2007 to 2013. He works on issues of democratic politics and in the comparative politics of South Asia. He's also served as an expert and consultant for the UNDP, World Bank, ICNRD, International IDA, IDEA, Ford Foundation, and Interparliamentary Union and Rights, regular columns for the Hindu, the Tribune, and Outlook. So with that, on to Professor D'Souza on imperialism of categories. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I can begin by saying how privileged I feel to be invited to speak on a panel at the University of Chicago in honor of uh, Suzanne and Lloyd Tudor. Uh, I, I've never been their student, moving from chemistry to political science. Uh, I sort of grew into the subject uh, reading some of their work. Uh, so when the invitation came to speak on, on this panel, I was delighted. Uh, I'm, so I'm going to really uh, s speak to some of their works and, and, and sort of think through them, think through with them uh, some of the issues that they raise. Uh, the essay that I've taken, because it's an essay that uh, uh, in a sense, speaks to my own current interests, uh, the imperialism of categories, and which I think uh, is a concern that connects up with all their work, with their first study in the you know, rural uh, regions of Tamil Nadu uh, to their much, much later presidential address, uh, uh, given that, you know, and also uh, an address given uh, in the 50-year celebrations of the CSP. <coughs> Now, that's a, that's a very important uh, you know, essay given by Susan Rudolph. Uh, and it raises the whole, it, 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 it's an overview uh, of uh, how does a political scientist from a different location work 
in, in an alien context. Uh, she begins with this wonderful story of 1956 when they came to Tamil Nadu, fresh from uh, being trained by Vioki Jr. and others uh, to actually go into the field and, and elicit opinions. It was a public opinion survey uh, of the people of Tamil Nadu on a range of issues. So they were all trained in the methodology of interviews. And one of the elements of that training uh, was to assume that the interview would be between the interviewer and the interviewee. And on the basis of that, they would, they would elicit opinions and then be able to discern certain trends. But when they went to the village, they were completely unprepared for the fact that the interviewee was not just the person, but the family, the children, and sometimes even the village elder who became part of the responses that they were listening. And they, they, that's when they realized that underlying the, methodol the methodological framework was a certain notion of methodological individualism. And that was something that needed to be contested. Now, uh, when we look at their work, uh, the imperialism of categories, uh, that essay actually has, if I, may, if I may sort of organize the argument, it has four stages. The first stage uh, is actually you know, uh, an epistemic argument that is made, uh, which, which, which is the serious argument that I want to engage with. And I, I may just quote from the essay. They say, they say, without concepts and methods, we would not know where to look and what to look for. The question was, and still is, to what extent were those concepts and methods amenable to infiltration, adaptation, modification and transformation by the forms of life and worldview of the alien others? I think this is the question that not only permeates their work, but permeates our work as well. I don't think we really are able, we, we really have exited that problem. We've acknowledged it, and Dipesh has acknowledged it in his provincializing Europe argument. But my sense is that even today, having acknowledged it and won the argument, that they are not as universal as they think they are, that they are actually parochial masquerading as the universal, if I may uh, you know, summarize the argument somewhat pithily, we don't push the argument far enough. Can we infiltrate those concepts? Can we modify and adapt and transform them? Is that available to us? Because unless we have concepts, we cannot access the world and represent it. And, uh, and uh, this remains the challenge. And I think the Rudolphs somehow in this wonderful essay, uh, having made the argument at two levels, they make the argument, this analytical argument up front, and then the rest of the essay is a series of illustrations through modernization theory, through, through Locke, through, through, uh, through work, through a uh, you know, classical universalist debate, and the modern universalism, they go into economic theory, Gary Becker, etc., etc. They go to the responses to that. So there's a very interesting overview through a series of illustrations of the fact that the universalism, the imperialism of category still persists. And, and that, is my, that, is, that is where uh, you know, uh, I would like to, to, make, to, to begin an argument with them. So if it still persists, how do we escape it? And I, and I really think, uh, you know, all the subsequent literature hasn't really engaged with this. I mean, to me, the seminal, the seminal statement of this uh, actually belongs to 1931. But the enslavement of the mind, we don't even know. So we begin to adopt those categories. And uh, Tagore talks about it when he's writing about the Eastern University. Now, there has been a debate insufficiently developed. These, we remain satisfied with pointing out that these are, these are not really universals. So what do we do? How do we escape it? Do we create our own universals? Is, it a, is, it, is that available to us? Uh, just because they are deficient or because they've emerged in a certain historical context, which is what the argument is, that it's deficient, it cannot help us understand. Or it has emerged in a certain context in Europe, uh, and, and we must recognize the context or that it is state-driven, you know. When, when area studies emerged in the United States, emerged because the State Department wanted knowledge about Iraq or India or whatever. So it, it's, it, it, has, it has an, it has a, it, it camouflages an interest of the State Department and therefore limitations. Now the question is, so what is our, and this is my start, and what is our critique? What are we saying? Okay, having won that first argument that is not as universal, <coughs> what, where is our lament? 
is a lament that the imperialism of categories is so powerful that it, 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 it clouds the way we see the world. And we meaning not just social scientists or humanities scholars, but all of us thinking people. So which is what, say, Franz Fanon would argue. Franz Fanon has some lovely, uh, I don't have the time, but some lovely passages where he talks in terms of how uh, a black man and a white woman, that you know, he wants to be white. Because the entire imperialism of categories, so you, I'm, I'm going to keep using that phrase, uh, produces a, a perception of inferiority in the art, in the colonies. So this inferiority uh, is, is a burden that the, the colonizers has to continuously carry to, to and, and therefore one way of overcoming it is pretending to be white. So is that the argument? Or is the argument a narrow argument that it's actually, uh, 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 it's actually, um, it's interfering with the way we social scientists and humanities scholars are representing the world. So it's, 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 it's you know, we're representing it with all the deficiencies that these categories bring. Uh, if it's the first, then there's a much larger argument than KCB, KC Bhattacharya, Rabindranath Tagore, and all the come. I've engaged with that, but I'll keep it aside. For you. If it's just the, two, the, the humanities and social sciences community that this paper is addressing, then uh, we have to ask the question, are we seriously searching for different categories? Is, is the argument only about categories, or is the argument also about the framework in which, in which categories are located? Okay? If it's only about categories, okay, we can look for alternative categories, maybe we can tweak them, we can infiltrate them, we can adapt them to suit, you know, it's like, like the, these advertisements in German cars, adapted to suit the Indian roads. You know, can, can we do an adapted to suit the Indian roads understanding of India? Uh, but but it's not so simple, you know. I mean, uh, uh, do we walk with another uh, University of Chicago scholar who should have been part of this debate, A.K. Ramanujan? Do we walk with Ramanujan and say that you know there is an Indian way of thinking? This, these universals are all, you know. I mean, if you if you sort of factor in India to the debate, then it's space, it's time, it's community. It's universal for who? For this caste group? at 12 o'clock in the afternoon, you know. Suddenly the debate has become the nature of universes. Uh, or, so that's one problem we have to wait through. I, I, you know, I mean, again, I don't have the time. Or do we, for example, and I want to pose the counter problem. Are we saying, say, you know, Spivak and others, that uh, natives have to speak, a kind of, uh, we can't represent them. Now, Leonard Wolf, in, in a, this is uh, the husband of Virginia Woolf, who was part of the administration in Sri Lanka, wrote a wonderful little book called The, the Village in the Jungle, uh, which to me captures the jungle, the village in the jungle, as well as Mahasha Kabir. So, how does a Leonard Wolf achieve that leap of imagination to tell the story that in many ways is superior to? Uh, representations by Sri Lankan scholars itself. So how do we how do we negotiate these two positions? Uh, now, the third problem that I think the imperialism of categories deals with is the question of hybridity. You know, our, our, our hybridity not of our spaces, because the, the Suzanne Goodall talks in terms of multiple modernities, and she concedes all the all the politically all the political challenges to universalism, she concedes. We can't work with binary, so it's ascriptive, affective, that is conceded. Uh, conceded is the area studies question. Conceded is the, 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 the aspect of uh, uh, making categories uh, more sensitive to the location. But hybridity is missing. As if there is a, there is a non-West, uh, which is which, which, which doesn't have the West in it, which doesn't have the West in it, and the other way around, you know. Uh, this, this problem of Buddhism in Europe, for example, would be a problem for her argument. Or, uh, and she ends by saying, you know, if, if you're wearing jeans and eating hot dogs, uh, that's, that really does not count for, your know, civilization still remains, you know. Uh, does it? I mean, does it? Are, are, we, are we living in a world where our categories must also be hybrid to reflect 
that represent the hybridity of our lives. And, and this aspect of hybridity is missing in the argument. So, so how does one escape the imperialism of capitalism? What should one do? Should one turn nativist and, 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 uh, and uh, say, no, I'm not going to, I'm going to only look for native categories? Uh, uh, and, or should one move in a kind of hybridity direction where we try and forge new, uh, you know, uh, forge concepts which, which have elements of both? Uh, or uh, do we, uh, you know, are we, are we, uh, um, you know, are we going to, uh, going to rely on the, the fact that, you know, we don't go kind of classical reverence. There is, there is this rationality which is driving the world, even though it is rejected after the critique of modernization. But let's recognize it. The world, the transformations taking place in the world are actually moving in a certain direction. And let's recognize it. Japan, China, India. In India, we celebrate too much this India exceptionalism. Right? And after Japan, on its core ideas, has become Western. And it, you know, so, 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 what is the position to take? And, and I think the imperialism of categories makes the right political points, but doesn't go far. Her publications include books such as Against History, Against State, Counter Perspectives from the Margin, <coughs> Shail Mayaram. The whole uh, rise of the backward class, the rural middle class, uh, also um, the book, their book uh, Modernity of Tradition, where they're talking about the whole modernization of caste. And that caste, you know, has is, you know, in terms of its new form as political associations uh, is playing now a completely different role in the context of democracy, which is quite removed from the kind of civilizational uh, role of caste, which was uh, more hierarchical. But uh, uh, let that be. Let me say that this is... Um, I'm really happy to be here and uh, to speak about the Rudolphs. This is the third event, uh, Rudolph event, I guess, that Asha and I have been part of. Um, I'd organized a, a memorial meeting for Suzanne at IIC, which Dipesh mentioned. It's called Celebrating Suzanne Heber Rudolph. Um, and we had some wonderfully moving presentations uh, on, that, on that panel. Um, then at the Jaipur Literature Festival, there was, uh, was part of an event called Remembering the Rudolphs, and that's on, on, the, on the website of the, of the uh, Jaipur Literature Fest Festival. Let me say that I've known uh, the Rudolphs as, first of all, I began uh, knowing them as, as, as friends of my parents, and then they were my teachers, the reason I went to Chicago, colleagues and, and friends. And and really mentors. Um, and I think after my mother, Suzanne was the person who was most concerned that, you know, and, and to keep asking me the question, when are you submitting your PhD thesis? Uh, so uh, I really uh, deeply mourn their pa passing. It, theirs was a unique partnership, I think, that, and I, and I feel really privileged uh, to have known them. Uh, I've referred to um, theirs as a Jugal Bandi. This is, you know, uh, uh, from Indian classical music. We also have a, another uh, term thinking about, you know, the idea of Sawal Jawab, question and answer. And very much, you know, uh, their, their presence together in a lot of discussions was something like that. Um, you know, where each filled in for the, for the, for the other. Um, <clears throat> I want to, uh, I'm going to uh, basically focus on the Rudolphs as comparativists and their methodological creativity. And um, I want to, first of all, um, I mean, first of all, of course, is their, their contribution as political scientists and theorists is, is most evident. Um, but the fact that they did historical sociology uh, very much uh, in the Weberian mode, and were given to these, you know, large-scale uh, macro uh, comparisons. Is something that I find 
have found very compelling in their work. Also, um, I think they were also political anthropologists. And I've been, uh, I've been reading recently something which I recommend to, uh, to everybody, uh, Suzanne Rudolph's book called Destination India, which is, um, be begins with their arrival in India when they're in their mid-20s. Tw uh, they've undertaken a journey from Salzburg to Peshawar, something like 7,000 miles in just uh, 350 uh, US dollars, uh, since the vehicle is also their bedroom. Um, and uh, they've also lost, uh, over this journey, uh, 10 pounds of weight each. Uh, and uh, this first part of, uh, of this book is titled The Year of Arrival in North and South India, Rajputs, Brahmins, and the End of the Old Order. And there's some tremendously interesting vignettes uh, in, in, in Suzanne's uh, uh, letters. Which I, and these letters actually combine the two genres in, ter, I mean, in terms of form, the epistolary genre of, of, of letters, but it's also uh, ethnography. Yeah. And it's wonderful ethnography. I take, for instance, um, you know, they have uh, these pen portraits of Congress politicians, both from the center and from the states. And there's a Rajasthan politician called Matradas Mathur, whom Suzanne refers to as uh, the new politician. You know, he's, he's not the Gandhi, uh, uh, Gandhian, Khadi-clad politician. So he's dressed in a more uh, obviously influenced by Bollywood kind of style, and uh, is also a kind of, uh, you know, maker and breaker of alliances of, of different kinds. Um, and um, what I, uh, uh, I want to also uh, emphasize is that in terms, uh, is their emphasis on methodological pluralism. This is something which uh, came up especially in their, in their later work. Um, and, and I think it's for that reason that Suzanne, in a sense, became a natural leader of what was called glasnost and perestroika in American political science which is a kind of you know, re revolution against the kind of quantitative, um, uh, mathematical, uh, game theory-oriented uh, political science uh, discipline. Now, I'm just going to focus really uh, in looking at, um, uh, at them as comparativists on an article which, which was published in the International Political Science Review in 2010. It's called Federalism as State Formation a theory of shared and negotiated sovereignty. Now, in this, they make the argument uh, that in the master narrative of the formation of the modern state, uh, its unified monopoly sovereignty is presented as universal, the natural culmination of a teleological process. And they're arguing that, we, that the article challenges the naturalness and universality of that claim by historicizing sovereignty. They locate federalism in the context of state formation uh, rather than in the context of what, what they call definitional or, comparat or, or comparative federalism, and so historicize it in the debate on, on sovereignty. Now, federalism, of course, has um, as we know, has become a particularly uh, important political solution to violent societies, uh, as well as has generated reflection on the post-national and as a possible alternative to the international system of, of nation states. Uh, they cite the doctoral thesis uh, of Jun Suk Kim, who my impression is was a Korean student for whose wedding. He's one of the something like 200 odd PhDs whom they, they supervised. And I remember them having gone for his wedding in any case. So his doctoral work is cited, which challenges uh, Sproop's contention and examines the polity of the Holy Roman Empire, the Swiss Confederation, and the Dutch Republic in the late medieval, early modern period, which uh, have been undermined, uh, they point out, in the literature on state formation and enlightenment historiography. Uh, the Rudolphs point out in this article that theorists and historians have highlighted the idea of, a sh of shared and negotiated, dispersed, divided, and contested sovereignty. And I quote, India's plur pluralist state and federal system may be a better way to deal with a multicultural society than a French-style nation state. 
Indeed, France now shares its sovereignty with 26 other EU states and negotiates with them about its scope and direction. As the EU becomes more viable and plausible, the accomplishments of India's federal system become more apparent." Unquote. Now, this article point, uh, makes the point that while the idea of federalism and the idea of empire have different ge genealogies, one is authoritarian, whereas the other is based on autonomy, uh, both involve a sharing of power with subordinate, parcellated, multi-ethnic polities. And they see Indian history as an alternation between the subcontinental empire and regional kingdoms. Uh, and they make the argument that in this kind of alternation, it was the imperial form which eventually won. This is in contrast to Europe, where monopoly sovereignty came to prevail, the absolute state. Uh, and um, in India, uh, on the other hand, uh, you had uh, what was a more segmentary conception of state power. So they make the argument, and, and this is where I'm coming to my, my disagreement, and I'm going to you know, sort of map my, my, my disagreement with them uh, you know, uh, on, on, on some of their arguments um, in, uh, in three points that follow. Uh, they, they, they point out that uh, this multi-centered sovereignty and contestation between empire and regional kingdoms continue through the period of rule of the East India Company. Uh, the presidency towns, according to them, were autonomous and represented a federal way of thinking. Further, the Indian Council's Act of 1867 established a federal state strengthened by the Monumental Reforms and the montague Chelmsford Act that established diarchy or shared sovereignty at the provincial level. Uh, and it also gave way to minorities in Hindu and Muslim majority provinces. The Nehru report and Simon Commission report, uh, they maintain contributed to thinking about federalism. Now my problem with this argument is that the colonial state, re uh, 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 and, and the question I'm uh, asking is that, the, did the colonial state really deepen and extend India's experience with federalism? And my question is, what about the instruments of centralization, of paramountcy and governmentality that include the census, law, revenue, and forest settlements that worked to undermine older notion, older modes of federal, segmentary, and the mandalic organization of sovereignty that you know, the Rudolphs discuss uh, elsewhere? Um, <clears throat> now, the article goes on to also talk about the Congress com commitment to federalism, the Motilal Nehru report, and the Gandhi Urban Pact. And they see the national debate between those who supported majority rule and unified sovereignty, such as Nehru, um, and those who supported shared and layered sovereignty, which derives from the regional kingdom perspective. Now, regarding uh, Jinnah, uh, they make the point that the Congress reneged on its commitment to share sovereignty with, Mus with the Muslim minority and rejected Jinnah's six points in 1928. But the point that I want to push, and th this, is a, you know, uh, this is something that they, they do not raise and do not contend with in the article, is that Jinnah was asking for 33 percentage weightage for Muslims, which is much more than in proportion to their population, then population, which was something like 25%. Um, and um, of course, uh, after the cabinet mission negotiations, um, the Viceroy Wevel uh, calls him a Frankenstein monster. Um, in any case, they go on to discuss the long and short term uh, causes of partition. And the long term, uh, they uh, make the argument that was Nehru's inability to share sovereignty territorially in a federal system. And, and I'm quoting here, his commitment to majoritarian democracy, uniform citizenship, and a unified central state stood in the way of sharing sovereignty. Nehru remained an enlightenment rationalist who viewed religion, Hindu, and Muslim as retrograde knowledge and religious identity as false consciousness. Uh, in the short term, there was Jinnah's intransigence in the face of Congress' unwillingness to share sovereignty uh, that, 
and uh, Jinnah eventually abandoned his liberal constitutionalism for religious dem dem uh, demagoguery, and uh, the result was the call for direct action on August 16, 1946, which led to communal violence. Now, the third area of my disagreement is on, on James Todd. And uh, James Todd, uh, I guess, will be the Rudolph's last work. Uh, it's in the press. And, um, and, uh, and I've read uh, you know, some of Lloyd's pieces where he makes the argument where he contrasts Todd with Mill. And he sees Mill as the up you know, as uh, uh, the upholder of the centralized imperial form, while he sees Todd making the argument for shared and dispersed sovereignty because of his orientation, his empathy for the Rajputs. And, um, uh, and so uh, he, uh, Lloyd, uh, in his argument, makes the point uh, that eventually, when it came to empire, it was Todd who won out, and therefore, the, um, the areas of indirect rule remained, hmm? and the, what were called the princely states. Uh, my disagreement, and I'm currently working on a, on a book uh, on the transitions of Indian nationalism from the Pax Britannica to the Pax Americana, and I'm making an argument about vernacular nationalism. And I think Todd's Annals and Antiquities of, of Rajasthan was a, a crucial Orientalist text which actually begins uh, and, and, and shapes in very fundamental ways um, nationalism, vernacular nationalism, specifically in the languages of Bangla, um, Hindi, Rajasthani, but also other languages like Oriya and so on. And uh, Todd's you know, image of the heroic Rajput you know, then became, becomes inspirational uh, for, pop for a kind of popular nationalism which you know, inflames uh, the literary public uh, sphere, and um, hence my uh, disagreement uh, on, on Todd. Uh, so thank you. The main areas of her interest are political and cultural economy of development in modern India, state and development in India, identity and politics in South Asia, and she's held various fellowships, including one from the American Institute of Indian Studies. Asha. Suzanne and Lloyd Rudolph, just wanted to share with you that we also at JNU had remembered them soon after Suzanne's, uh, soon after Lloyd passed away. And we had a large number of speakers, including some of their co friends and, and, and colleagues who admired their lives and works. Um, as Dipesh said, I was their student and I spent um, quite some time looking at them as iconic teachers, as scholars, as travelers of life and work, together with each other. So it's very difficult to speak about them thinking that they are no more, even though it has been almost three months uh, ever since Suzanne passed away. Um, so what do I have to say about them? Aditi said that you know it would be good to speak about their work as well as about some way in which we can expand and, and extend their work and think about new issues uh, of our times. So I have prepared my presentation accordingly. I was happy that Peter and Shell spoke before me because then I don't have to speak about imperialism of categories or federalism that I was planning to speak uh, in my talk. <clears throat> I thought what I would do is to talk about one category which actually haunts us all the time, particularly in our difficult times at this stage, that is the category of a state, and how the Rudolphs continue to think through this category in all their numerous writings. Of course, not just because they were political scientists, but I think ubiquity of the category, even though can, they contested it, always remained central to their almost all the writings. And not just about the state or Indian state more particularly, but also the idea of a state formation, which I think is quite unique and remarkable in their writings. And they continue to tell us that state and state formation in case of India and South Asia, and, and Shell has already mentioned that, they work in tandem with each other. 
uh, I have sort of made my presentation in three parts. And 60 years of their life together, 60 years of work together, I would like to describe them as contrapuntal couple in life as well as contrapuntal work in their life. So the title, Framing the Question of India, I think is absolutely appropriate to characterize their work. And let me start with a quote uh, that comes in one of their last works. And here it goes. We have had long innings and batted our fair share of runs in our long running academic test match with India. India and Jaipur in particular have become central to our lives. It, the quote goes on to suggest that the much that they worked on India or learned was also uh, with association of a large number of people who, with whom they associated and particularly with the large number of graduate students who worked under them. Almost 200 of them got PhDs under their supervision. And I think this is the best uh, gathering where we have students from JNU and other places here today. So the first experience of theirs, which has been captured in Destination India in many other places, and which they continue to reminisce as and when one got talking to them, because I spent mm -hmm numerous sittings with them over lunches, dinners, inside the classroom, outside the classroom. And the first road journey in 1956 was something that they always remember. But it is also interesting time when they came. 1956 was the time when the states were being formed in India. We were going through this very interesting, amazing uh, process called state reorganization. And Rudolphs were there to see it as, as if to feel the nerve of it. And that journey about the state and state formation continued to stay with them till their last breath. In all of their writings, which are numerous, I think if one starts counting, it is breathtaking. About one dozen books, 150 articles, and don't forget to read the article without the footnote. Lloyd was very particular that you know, you should write long and very, very intense footnotes. And I was reading one essay on state formation. Essay is only 14 pages long, but there are 80 footnotes. And you can't miss a single footnote because every footnote is connected to the text. Such a plethora of writing, such, such, uh, such a huge canvas, how does one make sense? Even if one talks about one particular aspect, that is about a state or a state formation. It's extremely difficult and, and, and not easy. So what I have done, I have chosen two books and two articles to, in a way, some loosely summarize their argument about state and in-state formation. And the two books also have a gap of 30 years. The one is Pursuit of Lakshmi, which was published in 1987. And 30 years later, Lloyd edited a volume with Jagupson called Experiencing the State. And I think there is, you can actually see the significant departure, both in methodology as well as in substance, in terms of their understanding about the idea of the state and the process of state formation, and how they continue to reflect and indicate it in these 30, 40 years of their intellectual life. And in the, in, so, so the first part will be about pursuit of Lakshmi, second part would be about experiencing the state, and third part I would concentrate on what are the newer areas maybe that Rudolphian framework can enable us to ha understand and address. Given the fact that the experiencing the state was published in, nine, in 2006, so there has already been a decade and much has a turbulent decade, rather, and much has changed in the last 10 years as well. So I'll also be making some sense of these 10 years when I talk about uh, how to take Rudolph's legacy forward. As they said themselves, you know, Rudolph wrote a lot, not just about numerous issues, but they also wrote, uh, wrote on their own writings, and they called it a career overview, which they published in India Review, long, a long, long essay in which they have indicated that they worked in seven different areas related to, their, uh, related to seven different forms of knowledge. And these they categorized as modes of inquiry, theory about political culture and social change, state formation, 
institutional change, identity politics, interpreting lives, Amar Singh's diary, foreign policy, international relations, Indo-US relations, and lastly, uh, interpreting India to the US and public intellectuals. So this was the you know, huge converse of uh, intellectual world that they traveled on. Area studies uh, were central to their inquiries, and they considered that it captured a central tendency of the method and substance of their work on Indian politics. But by 2003, that is almost after, um, from 1956 to 2003, they had come to understand that area studies knowledge had become what they called situated knowledge in their understanding. So they strongly argued in their numerous works how the diversity of the country affected in providing them with differences of conceptual categories. So you will see that in their writings, there is a quite a converse of different concepts and categories that they use. It's not just one framework with which they have worked. They always aimed at building bridges between given theories, or rather, I would say, theoretical paradigms, and existing empirical realities. And in the process, reshaping and refining both and not to be burdened by either of them. This allowed them to question the Western hegemony of theory as much as to learn and inform from their field to dwell upon its rich travesty to weave into their theoretical framework. So when you read any of their writings, and I have been you know, sort of reading their writings ever since I was their student, so there is this very uh, amazing uh, complementarity between theory and practice or between uh, conceptual word and the empirical word. They were truly inclusive interdisciplinarian as incorporating the works of anthropologists, sociologists, economists, historians, and social psychologists, a whole range of social sciences. And therefore, I think reading them also in some way uh, informs us the different paradigms of thinking in social science at large. But it was also with nuanced critical modes of inquiry that they conversed with a large number of interpreters and analysts. It was more like being a consistent interlocutor, bringing in new methods and modes of interpretation and forms of knowledge, expanding the frontiers of social science research on India. And this enabled them, this kind of a huge canvas, enabled them to be in tune with newer sensibilities of the field. Let me now start with, uh, say a little bit about the pursuit of Lakshmi, the political economy of the Indian state, which has been considered as one of their magnum opus work. It is very comprehensive. It covers a large canvas. It has been used as a textbook in many Indian universities and abroad for the last three decades. It goes without saying that it was one of the most celebrated work on Indian political economy of the time. But the book, I would like to say, did not have the same degree of theoretical punch as modernity of tradition, even though it was based on a very detailed descriptive empirical work. It is a book on the politics of economic development covering the journey of the Indian state along different policy arenas. It is also a book on political institutions, their growth and decline. And how do Rudolf's characterize the Indian state in this book is something that I would like to now talk about. Indian state in this book, and it was much criticized, challenged in, in, in several forums, including the Journal of Comparative and Commonwealth Politics, which carried out a special issue on the book. They describe Indian state as centrist, multi-class equilibrium, seeking and at once domineering and porous status quo from which some benefit more than others. They find green revolution settling the regional inequalities to some extent. And the book, very, uh, I mean, a well-known theory that the book gave was a demand and command politics. Dominance of the state makes class politics marginal, according to Rudolphs. The state itself is an element in the creation of the centrist-oriented social pluralism that has characterized the Indian politics since independence is one of the core arguments of this seminal text. They also argue that the state is a third actor in relation to capital and labor, dominated the organized economy, making organized labor and capital dependent on the state, 
and marginalizing the class politics. And I think this came under heavy criticism from a large number of scholars at the time when the book was published. This they argued through another concept in which they borrowed from Clifford Girch, an anthropologist, called involuted pluralism. Thus what they emphasized was that the presence of the state as a third actor contributes to the marginality, not the absence, but the marginality of class politics by making the state, rather than private capital, organized labor's what they call principal counter player. Organized labor, the second actor, also faced, according to them, formidable ideological, sectoral, and structural constraints on its capacity to engage in class politics. Private capitalism, since they were focusing more on the Nehruvian idea of the state, in the Nehruvian state became Permit License Raj, which was a dependent capitalism. It had to rely on the patronage and protection of the third actor, the Nehruvian state, for its profits and security. For them, the post-1991 shift is one from an interventionist state that plans and directs India's economy to a regulatory state that attempts to constrain and improve a market economy. But unlike many others, they argue that poverty, landlessness on its own does not result in political mobilization or protest. Instead, these variables need intervening agency to translate into the mob political mobilization or forms of protest. In their understanding, it is important to know how agrarian mobilization occurs and why differences in rural conditions and structures of poverty and landlessness affect the outcome in the form of protests. The book is very big. I really cannot do justice to it by summarizing it in few words. But just to give you a gist of the idea of the state or their understanding about the category of the state. Let me move to the second part of, of, of this brief presentation, which has to do with their uh, book on experiencing the state, the edited volume. And I think this book we must, uh, we really need to read, uh, read at this moment because we are experiencing a state in a very intimate manner, particularly most of us in JNU. It is a provocative volume departing from conventional studies on a state. Here the emphasis is not on the state as an idea, an abstraction, but a state and a stateness or its construction as encountered in everyday life. Not by naturalizing or universalizing, which I think uh, they talked about in many other articles, but by historicizing, going beyond the presentist understanding of the state as a category itself throws what I would like to say in Wittgensteinian terms a conceptual confusion. So journey of the state in their writing from feudal to modern to postmodern times also they would say has an inverse relationship between attention to stateness and attention to civil society. The story is one of the rise of the modern state in their early writings to the story of the modern state in decline in the later years, but never about the end or death of the state. This Lloyd says very categorically in the introduction of this volume. So situated framework, according to Lloyd, would help in experiencing the state in a variety of arenas, how state forms and manifestations are experienced by themselves or by citizens and explore the consequences of those experiences for politics and society. In this book, the idea is to treat states like nations in Benedict Anderson's sense as imagined communities that they say in the very beginning. It matters what and who regularly and routinely gets left out, how things people, events, relationships are represented, how meanings are produced within relations of power, and that's where the question of experiencing of the state becomes important. So in a somewhat prophetic manner, the book suggests that for the foreseeable future, the modern democratic state remains the leading institutional alternative for citizens to exert direct and compelling influence over those who govern them. It is therefore not simply state as high modernism, not as just an Nehruvian state paradigm. It is not just an a priori, abstract, contextless rationality, but also 
its increasingly ubiquitous surveillance, or what James Scott will call legibility and control that limits human freedom and threatens citizen rights. Suggesting that the idea of the state has come to acquire a certain degree of abstraction by universalizing and standardizing it in terms of what the state is, does, and means in the discipline of political science is the strength of this book. To avoid naturalization, therefore, they suggest that one must historicize the state by locating states in time, in place, and circumstances. So one can be contingent and evocative rather than definitive and essentializing. Idea of the state then and how it has changed in more than half a century from 20th to 21st century, and I think Rudolphs were there to see this long durée transition and transformation of the Indian state from 1956 to 2016, I would say. The later defined by globalization process, challenging both the sovereignty and territory, the two cardinal principles on which the idea of the state rests, both nationally and internationally. Now the states, in this book they say, have become problems rather than the solution. Having given us such sophisticated and critical canvas of thinking, through the complexities of the world and of South Asia and India around us, I hope we continue to engage and be inspired through their work and lives. And it is here that I would like to suggest that their work shows new and substantive categories of analysis, critical interpretative modes of inquiry, concepts formation, and many concepts we know from their writings, and directions for research for the alternative ways of understanding for the younger generation. Let me come to the last and the final section, <clears throat> which is, which I think Aditi suggested that we should talk about, is about the future research. How, do, how does Rudolphian paradigm, if there is one, would help us and if there are certain issues and, 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 and concerns that their work did not cover, maybe this time now to think about it. So I've listed some of them and I'll share those with you. I think um, a lot has changed in the field of state, state formation, both in terms of the conceptual apparatus, in terms of the methodological pluralism, in terms of the empirical reality of it. So if one is talking about rights and entitlement-based discourses, one also needs to situate the whole concept of rights and entitlement discourses and practice within the particular regimes, within the context of certain textures of epistemic and political violence that actually goes parallel in those discourses. Whether it is a question of RTI, Manarega, food security, UID, or service delivery mechanism. One needs to foreground how there is a broader structure of epistemic and political violence involved in it. That's the first area I think where one can begin to think about it. Second, I think, and which I think Rudolphs continued to uh, return to in different ways, is the idea not just of the state, but idea of the nation state or should I say idea of nation and nationness to be more precise, which is actually gazing us these days so much more. Third aspect or third frontier of future research could be on which Lloyd wrote a beautiful piece long back in EPW about uh, media and cultural politics, about the corporatization and mediatization of the state. And it's this that actually haunts our imagination and us as critical citizens of this country, how does the state get affected or can one go beyond this corporatization and mediatization of our lives? Fourthly, the increasing violent intervention of the market along with it, the state, how does that impact the, the, the democratic politics, the, the imagination of the democratic politics in so many different ways? Fifthly, the question of the governmentalization of the Indian state, I think, is extremely important, uh, particularly that uh, <clears throat> we are in our uh, very difficult times where the concept of governmentalization makes sense to us more and more on a day-to-day basis. Interface between political economy and cultural politics, which I think also remained 
uh, very dear to Rudolf's work in so many different ways. But we can see how the state has become oppressively intrusive in the daily lives of peoples and communities, and how the vilification of individuals and communities, some are seen as suspect, has become much more in our times. So the question of surveillance, question of legibility, of uh, the state uh, legibility of, uh, exercised by the state is something to think about. The nature and form of violence, nature and form of a fascist state that seems to be on rise in India at the moment needs to be grappled with. Interstate, interstate disparities, which have deepened the hierarchies of caste, class, gender, and region, and in turn have also given rise to ethnic identities and aspirations is something that reverberates in their writings, particularly in pursuit of Lakshmi. They used the term culture bound as form of categories and they used it to explain the context that they were studying. This could be another useful way of, of, of using different con categories, newer categories, newer forms of uh, analysis that could come by using culture bound categories. And I would just like to end by saying that the two short essays that they published in New Republic, one was titled Modern Hate, How Ancient Animosities Get Invented, and another was Organized Chaos, Why India Works. I think there are a lot of students here, you should be going back and reading these two essays. In fact, all of us should be reading these essays because it seems the idea of modern hate has come back in, in a very uh, disturbing way to us. The idea of involuted pluralism, of shared, layered, divided sovereignty that they talked about, the idea that multinational states like Russia and India, which they consider as exemplars for what is possible, is further worth exploring. So what is happening at the moment, even events at JNU and other universities, is something that I think Lloyd and Suzanne would have been deeply disturbed, but also would have uh, given us some way out. Because it's one work which we do not much talk about, which they did, which they wrote on university education, which is a masterpiece, I think, for their time and for our time now. The edited volume is called Education and Politics in India, Studies in Organization, Society and Policy, and it was published in 1972, 44 years ago. There are essays on almost all major universities, University of Baroda, Allahabad, Bombay, JNU doesn't figure because JNU was yet not formed at that time or was just being formed, just about to finish. So in this, I think because the students have come from JNU, I thought I'd just, just end with this. In this, what they have shown in the 1960s and 70s, that students more than workers shaped the national, they were scholar adventurers, they were iconic teachers, they were organic intellectuals, if I could call them. They were very careful researchers that you can see in their writings. They were great political ethnographers, something that we should create as a field of political ethnography. And more of all, they were exceptional, extraordinary, exemplar, contrapuntal intellectuals 